Hello and welcome class to another lecture where today we are going to be starting chapter six. So chapter six is all about Lewis structures. We are going to be learning today how to draw molecules. Right, so we've been seeing uh, so far, right, what it means to be an ionic compound, a molecular compound, and uh, we showed some pictures of molecules, and what we're going to be doing today is learning how to draw them. So we will be learning the Lewis approach, uh, and then learning a more standardized or like conventional uh, version of the Lewis approach today. Okay, so molecular compounds. Uh, this is just a review, right? We've seen this slide literally word for word before. Molecular compounds can be drawn or explained via Lewis's theory of bonding. So according to Lewis's theory of bonding, all unpaired electrons in a molecule are going to end up being shared. And specifically, they will be shared by or between non-metallic atoms because non-metallic atoms want electrons. They want electrons due to their high effective nuclear charge, due to their uh, high affinity for electrons. They're very good at stabilizing that electron density. So in uh, the illustration of these like little, you know, atoms down below where we can see that they are drawn uh, using their like Lewis symbols, which we've learned about before already, the uh, way that we connect the dots, the way that we draw a molecule according to Lewis's method is that we draw a line between all of these unpaired electrons. And again, this we've seen before, but just as a brief review, because we're going to be using this method today, like learning it, uh, you know, more directly, each of these unpaired electrons gets partnered together. And as we condense the structure down, as we can see on the right, all of the unpaired electrons now are paired around each of these atoms. Uh, so our oxygen is surrounded by eight electrons, which is what it wants, right? The goal in forming a molecule is to satisfy the octet rule for each of the atoms, except for hydrogen, in which case we satisfy the duet rule because hydrogen at most can only have two electrons around it. So that's what these Lewis dot symbols in this overall molecular structure are representing. The larger atoms like the oxygen and the carbon are both surrounded by eight electrons. And yes, we can double count like with these two electrons between oxygen and carbon, they will count both as a pair towards oxygen and as a pair towards carbon. The hydrogens, same thing, we have electron pairs present between two different atoms, but we're gonna double count once towards uh, one of the atoms, in this case hydrogen, and then a second time in the case of carbon. As the atoms come together and all of the electrons become paired, we form a charge neutral molecular compound. So this is our goal. We always want to make a charge neutral molecular compound and we do so primarily by partnering up all of these electrons. Now we will also, as a disclaimer, moving forward, be learning how to draw uh, polyatomic ions as well, but that's a little bit further down the road. So for now, we're gonna be focusing on making charge neutral molecular compounds. All right, so how do we know where to start? The way that we can determine kind of is <laughs> like at cursory glance, what atoms are going to end up being like in the center of a structure? What are the atoms that are going to end up being on the outside of a structure is by observing what we call the bonding capacity. The bonding capacity is equal to the number of covalent bond or yes, the number of covalent bonds that an atom can form to have an octet around uh, its valent shell. And how we can determine the number of covalent bonds that are possible is by looking at the number of unpaired electrons in your Lewis symbol. So if we draw out the Lewis symbols, let's say for example, for carbon, where carbon has four valence electrons, so we are going to place four electrons around our carbon, versus oxygen, which has six valence electrons, we're going to draw six electrons around our oxygen. Notice that we have two pairs and two that are unpaired. This is because in the process of drawing our Lewis symbol, we always start at the top and go around clockwise. So one, two, three, four, north, 
uh, was it, east, south, and west. And once we come back up to the top, then we place another pair. And technically we put could put a pair here. It doesn't really matter which side the pairs are on, just so long as we can see that we have two unpaired electrons here. Or in the oxygen that's further to the left, we see that there are two unpaired electrons here as well. So again, it doesn't matter exactly what the direction is, just so long as the number of unpaireds versus paireds is the same. All right, so since our oxygen, we can see, has two unpaired electrons, two unpaired electrons, this means that the bonding capacity, which I'm going to shorthand with this BC, is also equal to two. This implies that oxygen can form up to two stable covalent bonds in any type of molecular structure, once off of this electron and once off of this electron. Carbon has one, two, three, four unpaired electrons, which means that the bonding capacity for carbon is four. We can make up to four bonds with carbon in the center. So moving forward, we're going to be paying attention to the bonding capacity of our atoms, and this is gonna help guide us and tell us how many bonds can these atoms actually form in a stable way. All right, so let's start learning how to draw molecular compounds. We're gonna start small, right? Smaller molecules first. <laughs> I've gotta know how to walk before we can run. But we are uh, here going to be learning the Lewis dot symbol method, like Lewis's original method for drawing molecules. We are going to predict the structure using our valence electron configuration. And how we are going to do that is by observing again where the unpaired versus paired electrons are in our Lewis dot symbols. So if a pair of electrons can be found or can be made between two different atoms, if there's like an unpaired electron here and an unpaired electron here and we connect them with a line, this is going to be known as a bonding pair. This is a pair of electrons that are gonna be shared between two atoms. Now a lone pair is a pair of electrons that is not shared. This is going to be a pair of electrons that can be found only on one atomic center. They are not going to be shared anywhere else. Um, we don't necessarily have to know these names moving forward in order to draw our structures, but it's important to note what these names are since I'm gonna start freely using them, bonding versus lone pair electrons, uh, you know, just as we continue talking moving forward. All right, so let's draw the structure of water using this Lewis dot symbol method. Well, the way that we approach this is first by drawing out all of our Lewis dot symbols for all of the atoms that are going to be inside of this molecule. So our water, we're going to have those two lone pairs, right? These two individual pairs of electrons that are going to stay on the oxygen. And we have these two unpaired electrons, one on either side. Well, each of the hydrogens also has one valence electron, so we're going to give it one dot. And in order to draw the molecule, all we have to do is connect the dots, right? It's like going back to that kindergarten skill of connecting the dots. That's all what we're doing here. The line that we have drawn to the left and the line that we have drawn to the right are both bonding pairs. Right, we have one electron that is being donated by this hydrogen, one electron that's being donated from the oxygen. This is creating a pair that is going to count not only as satisfying hydrogen's duet, but also oxygen's octet. Same thing with the other bonding pair, right? Oxygen is donating a pair of electrons. Hydrogen, or I mean a, an electron, excuse me. Hydrogen is also donating an electron and they are going to pair together and count both towards hydrogen and towards oxygen. Now it may not be immediately obvious why we can double count like this if we just have our electrons static on the page like so, but remember that our electron pairs are dynamic. They are constantly moving. And what it means to be in a bond is that the electrons are constantly hovering from one atom to the other, and then from the other back to the first. So a bonding pair of electrons is actually oscillating back and forth, lassoing our atoms together. This is why we can double count this electron pair, both for hydrogen and for oxygen, is because the electrons are actually moving back and forth between these two centers. And it does so fast enough that for all intents and purposes, we can kind of, like if we squint our eyes, <laughs> it appears as though they're in two different places at the same time. 
right? In reality, they're not. It's just they're moving so quickly that the atoms don't know any better. All right, here we're also going to introduce the definitions for a single bond versus a double bond. So what we've drawn already are single bonds. This is a pair of electrons that is shared between two different atoms. A double bond is twice that. We have two pairs of electrons that are shared between two atoms. So we're going to be putting twice as many electrons inside of the same space and seeing what happens. So the structure, uh, or we can draw the structure of carbon dioxide using that Lewis dot symbol approach, and it's gonna be pretty obvious where the uh, higher leveled bonds, these double bonds are gonna be coming from. So our carbon, we're gonna draw in the center, oxygen on the left and on the right, and we're gonna fill in the Lewis dot symbols, right? So our carbon has four unpaired valence electrons. Each of the oxygens has six valence electrons, meaning that we have two unpaired, just like we've seen before. And how do I know which of these atoms is supposed to be in the center versus which are gonna be on the outside? Well, again, our carbon has the highest bonding capacity. This means that it will be put in the middle caveat, there are some exceptions to this, but for right now, we're looking at molecules where there are no exceptions, right? Again, we have to know the rules before we know how we can safely break them. So we need to put our carbon in the center. This is going to give us the highest chance of forming one cohesive molecule since this carbon can network out from the center uh, more effectively, right? Because then is twice the number of the bonding capacity, twice the chance to make bonds as opposed to these oxygens but we are going to start connecting the dots. One unpaired electron connected from oxygen to carbon, another unpaired electron connected between carbon and oxygen. And yes, we are allowed to like draw these curved lines. What is the most important is that we are connecting unpaired electrons. We can kind of clean up the picture after the fact. But the first task is to figure out where, whoop, not that one, this one can't have one electron bonding with two different things. Let's get rid of that, sorry for that mistake. I was a little too gung-ho. The important thing is that each of our previously unpaired electrons is now connected to another unpaired electron. It doesn't matter where these unpaired electrons are because the molecule can rearrange. These bonds, again, are dynamic because the electrons are always moving. So we can rearrange, recondense, and say that our oxygen still has its lone pairs up on top and down below, but now the previously unpaired electrons are both gonna be on the same side and bonding to the central carbon. Similarly, this central carbon is gonna have two bonds to the oxygen on the right, where its lone pairs are still intact, but the two previously unpaired electrons are now gonna be here on the left. So there are a total of two, four, six, eight electrons that are hovering between the oxygens and the carbon in the center. Now we do have twice the number of electrons hovering between the carbon and the oxygen. What this does for us, what this does for the chemical bond is it actually makes it stronger. We don't just have one lasso of electrons moving between the oxygen and the carbon, we have two lassos that are independently moving and fluctuating between these two different atomic centers. So with twice the lasso, we now have approximately, at least from this analogy, twice the strength. It doesn't exactly scale up that way. We're going to be looking at some actual bonding energies in a little bit. Um, but it is important to note that the greater number of electrons shared between two different atomic centers, the stronger the bond is going to be. All right, well, if there is a single bond and if there's a double bond, can we continue increasing the number of electrons between two atomic centers? Can we make something like a triple bond? And the answer there is yes. We can make a triple bond between two atoms where we're going to have, as a result, three pairs of electrons shared between two different atoms. If we can make a triple bond, are quadruple bonds uh, possible? What about quintuple bonds? The answers there are also yes, but the bond or the nature of that type of bond, that really high ordered bond is 
beyond the scope of this class. So we are going to be focusing on single, double, and triple bonds. If you would like to see in the future, uh, some like quadruple bond, some quintuple bond action, I would advise like continue taking chemistry classes. Uh, we will run into those bonds in the higher leveled courses. All right, but for now, <laughs> not getting ahead of ourselves, let's see where this triple bond comes from. So we're going to draw the structure of HCN. Uh, again, we're going to put the element with the highest bonding capacity in the center of the structure, which we've seen already carbon has a bonding capacity of four. Our hydrogen, we've also seen, has a bonding capacity of one. And so we can ask ourselves the question, what's the bonding capacity of nitrogen? Well, we're going to draw the elemental symbol and then start adding dots around, again in this clockwise fashion, one for each of the valence electrons. Nitrogen, if we look on the periodic table, has five valence electrons. So we're going to place one, two, three, four, and five. So we can see that nitrogen, based off of its Lewis dot symbol, has a bonding capacity of three. Even though there are five valence electrons, one forms a pair that will remain on the nitrogen. And we can see that we only have one, two, three unpaired electrons that are able to go out and bond in some type of covalent way. All right, so our carbon, we are then going to draw in the center since it has the highest bonding capacity. And our hydrogen, we're gonna just draw off on the other side, right? We want carbon to be in the middle since this one has the highest bonding capacity. And so we would assume that hydrogen will bond to carbon and the nitrogen will also bond to carbon. All right, so here we're just gonna start connecting the dots. Hydrogen only has one unpaired electron, so we're gonna form a single bond to our carbon in the center. And we can see that there are still three unpaired electrons on carbon and three unpaired electrons on nitrogen. So we're just gonna connect these dots just like before. And also just like before, it doesn't matter that the electrons are kind of spread out. We can connect the dots like this because after the dots are drawn, after the dots are connected, we can condense the structure down. We can kind of rearrange the placement of these single unpaired electrons now paired. And so each of our three unpaired electrons on carbon, we're just gonna move to the right. And the three unpaired electrons on nitrogen, we're gonna move to the left. We're just gonna draw these lines, connecting them like so. All right, nitrogen maintains its own independent lone pair, but it is also going to be sharing its three unpaired electrons with carbon. And similarly, carbon's gonna be sharing its three unpaired electrons with nitrogen. So we can see just by visualization, right, our carbon has two, electrons right here around it due to the bond that it's making with hydrogen. And it has six electrons on the right hand side total thanks to its uh, sharing its unpaired electrons with nitrogen. And two plus six gives us a total of eight. Carbon's octet is satisfied. Similarly, the nitrogen also is uh, surrounded by six electrons in type of or inside of the triple bond with carbon, six electrons total, plus the two lone pair electrons that it is keeping for itself. This also gives us a total of eight. So all of our elements here are either satisfied by the duet rule, which is our hydrogen surrounded by two electrons, or are satisfied uh, in terms of the octet rule because they're each surrounded by eight electrons. Before we move on to learn the more modern, like conventional approach for drawing Lewis structures without always needing to like draw out these dots uh, is to observe what the relative energy is of the bond types that we've looked at so far. Uh, reason why we're doing this before like, again, moving forward with our like conventional drawing uh, method is it's just important to like really recognize what it is that we're working with. What are we drawing? So these single bonds are known as the weakest bonds. For instance, a carbon to nitrogen single bond uh, has an internal energy of 293 kilojoules per mole. The single bond between two different nitrogens has 163 kilojoules per mole. And this, are these two numbers off on their own may not mean a lot, which is why we're going to compare them to the uh, same bonding structure, like the same elements are present, the carbon and the nitrogen versus nitrogen and nitrogen. Only now we're looking at the triple bond version. Triple bonds are known as the strongest bonds, at least of the types that we're talking about in general chemistry. A carbon to nitrogen triple bond is nearly 900 kilojoules per mole. 
and the nitrogen to nitrogen triple bond is over 900 kilojoules per mole. So if we're comparing these numbers to the single bond version, we can see that the carbon to nitrogen single bond scales up basically by a factor of three, uh, not entirely by a factor of three, but basically by a factor of three to get up to the carbon nitrogen triple bond, uh, right? Single bond turns to triple, the energy basically also triples from here to here. The nitrogen nitrogen single bond, however, when it scales up into a triple bond, we can see that it strengthens by more than a factor of three, right? It goes from being less than 200 kilojoules per mole to being greater than 900 kilojoules per mole. The nitrogen to nitrogen triple bond is very strong, stronger than one uh, would expect. And we can explain this uh, relative increase in strength more than what we would expect to, uh, you know, attributes like the effective nuclear charge, the relative size of the atom, uh, and how short this bond distance is going to end up being. So we can make a conclusion here, the more bonds that we are working with between two different atoms, the more energy the bond is going to have. And the more energy a bond has means that you are working with something that is more stable. There is a lot of energy contained, a lot of potential energy contained inside of each of these bonds. And this is the equivalent of then the amount of energy we would have to put into the system in order to break the bond. So the greater the bonding uh, energy, the greater the bonding strength. All right, well, there's another association that we have learned with energy previously, back in chapter three, that energy was inversely proportional to wavelength. And you might just ask yourself, well, I thought we were talking about like electrons and atoms, like do wavelengths really apply? Remember that electrons can also behave as waves. And the reason why this is important to acknowledge right now is that the relative strength of our bonding energy is also going to impact the length of the bond due to the wavelength capabilities of the electron itself. So the association that we can make due to our Planck's equation in the form of E is equal to HC divided by lambda. <laughs> How many of you were expecting to never see that again? Surprise, it's here. Uh, the more energy we are working with, the shorter your wavelength. Right, that is the relationship association inside of this equation. So the more energy, the shorter the wavelength of your electron. Well, the shorter the wavelength, which is represented by this peak to peak measurement right here, the shorter the wavelength of your electron, the tighter your nuclei are going to be pulled into each other. So single bonds, we can see uh, some lengths that are listed here. Um, our single bonds are going to be the longest because they are of lower energy, they're going to have longer wavelengths. Because of the longer wavelength, we can see that there are longer bonds between the carbon and the nitrogen and the nitrogen and the nitrogen, relative to if we make a triple bond, which these create the shortest of the bonds that we are referring to, where the carbon to nitrogen bond contracts down to 116 picometers, and the nitrogen nitrogen triple bond contracts down to 110 picometers. This contraction specifically comes from this association right here. More energy of your uh, bond creates a shorter wavelength in your electron's nature, which is going to really pull the two atoms together. It's going to contract that bonding distance. All right, so even though we on paper are going to be drawing single bonds and triple bonds with all different lengths, just because we are imperfect and we're not really paying close attention to exactly how long we draw all of these things, the reason why we're talking about this, again, is to really just emphasize that single bonds are different than triple bonds, both in terms of construction, energy, and total wavelength. Because the wavelength is different, this also is going to impact the bonding distance. Well, we've seen using Lewis dot structures how to draw molecules, and we've also seen what the relative energies and strengths and distances of these bonds are. So why do we really need to learn any type of conventional method for drawing our Lewis structures? Like, isn't the Lewis dot method enough? 
Well, sadly, the Lewis dot symbol method does not work every time. If we tried to draw something like sulfur hexafluoride using this Lewis dot symbol method of starting uh, with our element that has the greatest bonding capacity in the center, sulfur, which is just below oxygen on the periodic table, also has a bonding capacity of two due to its uh, six valence electrons. And all six of our fluorines have a bonding capacity of one. I'm just gonna draw them kind of all around this central sulfur. The reason why our fluorines have a bonding capacity of one, we can see as we draw its Lewis dot symbol with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven valence electrons. So we can see that there's one unpaired electron on this fluorine, which will be true of all of our fluorines. So I'm just gonna draw all of these bonding pairs and the single unpaired electrons on our fluorines like so. Last one, dot, 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 okay. So our goal, just like before, is to connect the dots, right? We want to connect our unpaired electrons. Well, because sulfur has a bonding capacity of two, it can only make two bonds with our fluorines, like so. The rest of our fluorines have unpaired electrons, and so we're just gonna partner the unpaired electrons, like so. What this means is that our sulfur, <laughs> if we like recondense our structures down, should only be able to make two bonds with all of our fluorines, not a total of six. And we should have two fluorines, or two difluorides. Da, 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 fluorine, fluorine, single bond, dot, 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 and dot. This should be the total structure, right? We should, according to the Lewis dot symbol approach, come up with three individual molecules if we tried to draw something like sulfur hexafluoride. However, sulfur hexafluoride is a very stable and readily abundant molecule. This does exist in the real world. And so if our method for drawing molecules cannot completely comprehensively lead us to a structure for every single molecule that we know exists, it means that there's something wrong with the model or the approach that we're using. So Lewis's uh, approach, which we've just spent time learning, was really good for the small molecules that we had identified and characterized back in like the 1930s, uh, 20s, 40s, like that kind of early 1900s era. However, as we continued to expand our knowledge of the molecules in the world around us, we had to come up with a more generalized approach for drawing these molecules to make sure that we were able to draw molecules like the sulfur hexafluoride if we needed to. So this is what we're going to spend some time learning. Then uh, the rest of this lecture today is just what are the rules for drawing Lewis structures in a more conventional and general way that's going to work for us basically every time. All right, well, where we start, rule number one, we are going to count the number of valence electrons of each of the atoms inside of our molecule. We're not going to leave the electrons on each of the individual atoms. Instead, what we are doing in this approach uh, is we are going to scoop up all of the valence electrons. We're gonna keep them for ourselves, and then we will redistribute the electrons back to the atoms as necessary once we start drawing the structure. So the best way to really see what I mean when I say uh, or describe that approach is just to do it. So we are going to take the two times one valence electrons for our two hydrogens here. And we're gonna add that to the six valence electrons in our oxygen here. And this gives us a grand total of eight valence electrons to work with. So currently, if we were to kind of like draw a parallel between this approach and the previous approach, our oxygen, hydrogen, and hydrogen have no valence electrons on them right now. We've picked up all of the valence electrons and now we are going to start giving them back as necessary. All right, so we are going to, in step number two, start doing just that. We're gonna give the electrons back where they need to be. We're going to draw what is known as the skeletal structure first. The element that normally or conventionally has the highest bonding capacity, we're gonna place in the middle, and we're just going to draw the bonds, draw the lines, 
necessary to form bonds with all of the surrounding atoms that are present. So our oxygen is going to have one bond on the left and one bond on the right. In doing so, we have currently placed a total of two electrons on the left and two electrons on the right. Right, so there is a total of eight valence electrons that we scooped up and we have currently placed two four electrons back into the structure. Right, so step three, we also just did. We counted the number of electrons currently uh, present inside of the covalent bonds, two per bond. There were two electrons on the left, two electrons on the right, giving us a grand total of four electrons placed. Right, so we're just tying this slide with the previous slide. Two electrons on the left bond, two on the right, four total have been placed. Well, in this approach that we are taking due to the conservation of mass, we cannot hold on to any extra or leftover electrons. We started with eight total valence electrons and we've placed four electrons. This means that we have four electrons left over that still need to be placed. Right, we cannot hold any leftover electrons. If we want to adhere to the conservation of mass, if we picked up a certain number of electrons at the beginning, we're gonna have to put all of them back in the structure somewhere. The remaining four electrons are going to be placed where they are needed the most. So how do we know where they are needed the most? Rule number five states that leftover electrons are going to be used to complete the octets of terminal atoms. These are the atoms on the outside. So just to redraw our skeletal structure, the terminal atoms in this example are the hydrogens, right? We have a terminal atom on the outside with our hydrogen on the left and one with our hydrogen on the right. So we're gonna ask ourselves, do either of these hydrogens need any more electrons? If they need electrons, we will give them electrons. If they don't, then we still get to hold on to those four valence uh, or those four leftovers and we're gonna move on to the next step. Well, our hydrogen on the left is currently surrounded by two electrons, right again, two per bond. Because the hydrogen on the left is satisfied with its duet rule, we don't need to give it any more electrons, it is happy. Hydrogen on the right has the exact same story. There are two electrons present inside of each bond, that's what this line represents, and so because hydrogen is also satisfied with its duet rule, it doesn't need any more electrons. So we still have four electrons left over that need to be placed. We didn't give any more to hydrogen, and so now we are going to observe the central atom. The goal with an oxygen is to complete its octet. We want to make sure that every atom that needs its octet met and satisfied has that octet. Well, currently the oxygen is surrounded by two, four, right, two on each side, electrons, which means it still needs four in order to complete its octet. How perfect that we still have four electrons left over. So we are going to give this oxygen two, four electrons in order to satisfy its octet, making the oxygen very happy indeed. So the overall structure that we drew right here looks exactly like the structure that we were able to draw using the Lewis symbol method. So we picked out an example where we already knew what the end product was supposed to look like and we can really see uh, by walking through each of these rules with this uh, kind of simple case that by following this more general approach we are also going to be getting the exact same structure had we followed the Lewis dot symbol method. All right, but again, the testament to this set of rules is that it will work for structures uh, that are, it works for drawing structures where the Lewis dot symbol approach fails and we will be getting there. Before we see those more advanced examples, we are going to learn a couple of additional rules for the special structures, those that contain double bonds, triple bonds, and even the ones that contain charges. All right, so double and triple bonds. How do we know when we need to draw these? 
double and triple bonds will arise if, according to rule number seven, an element has an incomplete octet after all electrons have been placed. So if your pool is empty and there's still an atom that has an incomplete octet, if it's not happy, if it's not satisfied, what we're gonna have to do is push pairs, push lone pairs from the terminal atoms in toward the center. We are going to force atoms to share. This is going to be for the greater good of the molecule, for the greater stability of the molecule. Uh, and in doing so, we are going to create double or triple bonds where necessary. All right, so we can follow our rules to draw the Lewis structure for HCN. So again, we're gonna follow those previous six rules and then we're gonna add rule number seven to the end of the list. So HCN, we are going to start by counting the number of valence electrons. And our total valence electron count is going to be a total of one from our hydrogen, four from our carbon, and five from our nitrogen. So notice again, we're not adding up the bonding capacities, we're adding up the total number of valence electrons. This means that our HCN has a total of 10 valence electrons that we have collected. And over the next five steps, right, we're going to be placing the electrons slowly back in in a systematic way. Next, we have to draw our skeletal structure. Because our carbon conventionally has the highest bonding capacity, it will still be placed in the center, a hydrogen on the left, a nitrogen on the right. If you wanted to, you could draw the nitrogen on the left, hydrogen on the right, you could draw them above and below, it doesn't really matter, just so long as you have them around the carbon in some way. So the skeletal structure then means that we're going to draw the bare minimum number of bonds necessary in order to just start connecting the dots, right? We're connecting the atoms together. So hydrogen will bond to carbon, using up two of the electrons in our pool. The carbon is going to bond to the nitrogen, also using up two of the electrons in the pool, meaning that we're gonna subtract out four electrons placed and giving us six electrons still left over to place. Well, according to rule number, just to go backwards, five, he, we are here, we are going to use the leftover electrons to complete the octets of the terminal atoms first. All right, so the terminal atoms are going to be the hydrogen and the nitrogen. So our hydrogen, just like before, is bonded already using two electrons, right? Each bond, just to reiterate, is comprised of two electrons in a single bond form. So our hydrogen has two electrons already around it, it is satisfied according to its duet rule. Nitrogen does not follow the duet rule. Nitrogen is also surrounded by two electrons, but it needs to follow the octet rule. Nitrogen needs to be surrounded by eight electrons, it's currently surrounded by two, meaning that we need to place six more electrons around nitrogen in the form of lone pairs. And wouldn't you know it, we have six electrons left. So let's take those six, place them all around the nitrogen like so. So we have a lone pair up on top, a lone pair on the side, a lone pair down below, and now our nitrogen is surrounded by two, four, six, eight electrons, and we have nothing left in our pool. Well, as a way to check that the molecule is stable and that your Lewis structure is finished, we must observe the octets and or duets of all of the elements present. So hydrogen follows the duet rule, as we already established, it's perfectly satisfied. Our nitrogen, which we just gave an octet, is also satisfied. If we turn our attention to the carbon in the center, however, it is only surrounded by two, four electrons. It is missing electron pairs, it is not satisfied. So what we're going to have to do now is turn our attention to rule number seven. We cannot follow rule number six because again, we are out of electrons. There is nothing left in our pool and we can't just grab electrons from the ether. Uh, again, we're trying to adhere to the uh, law of conservation of mass. So if we need more electrons on carbon, we're gonna have to pull them from the electrons that we can already see in the structure. 
So rule number seven states that because we have this unsatisfied element, this incomplete octet in the center, we are going to take electron pairs from our terminal atoms and push them towards the center. Now specifically what this means, I'm just gonna clean up the smiley faces a little bit to give myself room to draw what I'm about to draw. What this means is that we are going to be taking electrons from not inside of the bonding pairs, but from lone pairs. The reason why is that bonding pairs are already present between two different atoms. It doesn't really make sense to take a bonding pair and just push it onto one atom. That would imply that you're breaking the bond. What we're going to do instead is tell nitrogen, listen, you're being greedy, and so we need to take some of these electrons and you're gonna have to share with your friend in order to satisfy both of you. So the nitrogen will donate a lone pair in towards the center uh, or in between the carbon and the nitrogen. So we can see now that we have created a double bond. This lone pair no longer exists solely on the nitrogen. It is giving up some of its electrons for the sake of carbon's stability. All right, so the nitrogen we can see in shifting the electrons over into the bond is still surrounded by two, four, six, eight electrons. So nitrogen is still satisfied. Carbon is now surrounded by two, four, six electrons. So carbon is still unhappy. It still needs two more. So we're gonna say, listen, nitrogen, like I know you just donated a pair, but you need to donate two more in order to really make sure that this molecule that you're a part of doesn't fall apart. So the nitrogen's gonna donate two more electrons, two more of its lone pairs, or one of its lone pairs in the form of two electrons. Uh, and it's going to push them in towards the center. In doing so, we can see that the nitrogen has not lost any stability. It is still surrounded by two, four, six, eight electrons. It still has exactly what it needs to fulfill the octet rule. And the carbon is now surrounded by two, four, six, eight electrons as well. So by pushing some electrons off of the nitrogen in towards the center, in between the carbon and the nitrogen, both the carbon and the nitrogen have successfully satisfied the octet rule and now are both perfectly happy and stable. We can see in doing uh, or in following this approach, again, we ended up with the exact same structure as what we drew before uh, using our Lewis dot symbols. So this is a good way to verify this new method uh, is like a sort of check and balance system. All right, so we've successfully drawn water and HCN using this more generalized approach. But there is one more rule that we have to add to this general list. One more rule, and then we can call it a day. So what we are going to learn is how to draw polyatomic ions. These are, again, molecules with a charge. And to try and draw these using the Lewis dot symbol approach uh, can be kind of tricky. So we're going to instead just learn how to draw them using straight up our more generalized approach and observing uh, or and by observing this last rule that we can add to the list, we're gonna use this when necessary. If a charge is present, so if you're working with something like the ammonium polyatomic ion, this charge is going to symbolize that we must either add to or subtract from our total valence electron pool. So rule number eight, if it's necessary to use, we're actually going to like slip it right in at the top. It's going to change what our total valence electron pool is before we even start drawing the molecule. All right, so let's look at ammonium as an example here to see how rule eight applies. So because we are working with a polyatomic ion and we have a plus charge here, what this plus charge symbolizes is that we have lost one electron somewhere. We don't know if the nitrogen lost an electron, we don't know if the hydrogen's lost an electron, but we do know across the entire molecule we are missing an electron somewhere. So what this means is as we are adding up our total number of valence electrons for ammonium, five from the nitrogen, and four uh, additional electrons from each of the hydrogens, right, four, that should be times, four times one. Across this pool somewhere, we have lost a single electron. So if we're working with a polyatomic ion that has a positive charge, this symbolizes a loss of an electron, which is going to amend our uh, total valence count exactly like this. We're gonna subtract one electron to represent that loss. 
All right, so our total electron count then of five plus four minus one gives us eight valence electrons that we can actually work with here. So rule eight, again, check. We've already accomplished this. We have modified our total valence electron pool, and we're gonna follow the rest of the steps as necessary. So we're gonna start by drawing our uh, Lewis, our skeletal structure <laughs> of the Lewis structure. And uh, just as before, we're gonna put the element that has the highest potential bonding capacity in the middle. So nitrogen normally has a bonding capacity of three. In this case though, it is going to be bonded to four different hydrogens. Right, so it doesn't matter what the nitrogen's bonding capacity is when it comes to polyatomic ions and due to the fact that some electrons are gonna be missing or there will be excess electrons around, we can kind of fudge the bonding capacity expectation a little bit. So again, we are going to draw our skeletal structure. We have now currently placed a total of two, four, six, eight electrons around our central nitrogen, and we have a total of eight electrons in our pool. So eight minus eight gives us zero. There are no leftover electrons that we have to place. As a last step, since we don't have any, we have no leftover electrons to add to the terminal atoms, we have no leftovers to add to the central atom, what we just need to do now is double check is everyone satisfied? Our hydrogens each are surrounded by the two electrons in the bonding pair, so check, 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 and check, all of them are satisfied. And the nitrogen in the center is surrounded by two, four, six, eight electrons, all in the form of bonding pairs, so check. Our nitrogen is also satisfied. What this gives us is the overall structure for the ammonium polyatomic ion. I'm just gonna get rid of these real quick. The last thing that we need to do in order to really emphasize the fact that this is a polyatomic ion, even in this molecular structure kind of form, even as we're looking at the picture of it, is to add brackets around it with a little plus sign. What the brackets around this molecule means is that somewhere there is an electron missing, meaning across the whole molecule, we have a leftover of a positive one charge. So just like how we have a plus charge in the chemical formula, we're gonna have to have a plus charge in the Lewis structure as well somewhere. All right, so that is part one of our lecture here. <laughs> and you might be saying, well, hey, I thought we were gonna learn how to draw the more advanced structures, and we will, just have patience. We need to learn, again, these more general rules, as well as before we get to the more advanced structures, we're gonna have to touch base about a couple of other concepts and definitions as well. So in part two, we're going to really be fleshing out some more of the exceptional Lewis structures. And by the time we get to part three, we are going to return to sulfur hexafluoride and really see how we can draw structures that truly cannot be drawn using Lewis dot symbols. But for now, we have some example problems pertaining to drawing Lewis structures, so you guys can get some good practice doing this. Uh, and if you have homework, double check. Please do your homework. Until next time, class is dismissed. <laughs>